Okay, very well. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about the basic, some basic uh, methods of using an LLC. We're going to be talking about how to use a fictitious name or a DBA. Um, and also, why would you want to do that? Uh, there are some situations where you do want to do that. But generally, um, if you haven't seen any of my other videos, I, I usually talk about how to structure the ownership of assets or the management of cash flow in a way that changes the property rights that you normally are told to, to, to use a certain way. You're, you're normally instructed to use uh, companies or LLCs in a way that creates liability. What I do is show people how to change the property rights in a way that avoids liability. Here's a quick example. If I'm gonna get interest or dividends from an asset, stock or something like that, or I'm gonna sell gold and get dollars for it, and I'm gonna get a 1099, I can legally avoid that, creating that tax liability if I just change the way I sell the property or hold the property rights. And we can get into more detail on that. But um, Dawn here had uh, some really good questions and I wanna let her uh, start with her questions and we'll let this uh, take place how it, how it unfolds. Okay, so I guess my first question is the, why don't we start with the DBA? Um, okay. When would you use it? Um, what name would then you use on your bank accounts and how would you go about changing um, the LLC to use the DBA? So there's two, two purposes. Yeah, that's a good question. There are two purposes. On a DBA, I'm going to probably do it for marketing. So if I want to try some new advertising and I want to do it in a different name, so I'm processing payments in a different name and or I'm advertising in a different name other than my core company name or my brand name. Maybe I want to do something. I'm going to advertise to a market where I don't want to mix my other market that I have with my, my brand, I want to do something new and just test it and see what happens. Maybe it's going to fail. Maybe people don't like the offer, right? I don't want to connect that to my original. Okay. So I can then, I can offer it to the prospective customer and I can process the sale through my merchant account under the fictitious name or DBA using the same company. So it's going to save me the money of registering a new company in the you know, all that uh, nonsense of uh, getting a tax number and bank account. So the way I do it is, and that one example is I would just go to the bank because the bank is going to be the one I'm needing, needing to deal with. Cause I can advertise a DBA. I can, I can make up any name I want and I can place an ad, I can put a Facebook post, but when it comes to the bank, I need to clear the funds. So you, you got to go to the bank, your merchant processor and your bank account or both and ask what the bank wants to see to recognize a fictitious name for your current account holder. So you have an LLC that's already running everything and you go to the bank and say, hey, I wanna start processing payments under a new fictitious name or a DBA and, or a trade name. And so the bank will usually tell you something like, um, register it with a state and give us a certificate. So that what you do is you go back to your secretary of state and it could be in any state. Now, sometimes the bank, I don't know, you don't have to domesticate your company so just keep that in mind. Like sometimes the bank will say, oh, you got to bring your, your register it over here where you live, and then we'll let you do it. You don't really have to do it that way. But basically, the bank's going to tell you, go back to the state, register a fictitious name. You would make your LLC or your company the owner of that fictitious name. That's how it works. Mm. And then they might do a couple of things. The bank will say, okay, now that we see that you register with the state, we will, we will amend your account. We'll, we'll change it so that we can accept payments either way or we want you to open a new account or they'll do it for you. Just they'll open another account, you know, so you have two accounts now, all right? And they can merge them and all that stuff. So then you got, you got your merchant account, your check processing and or your bank, your core bank account. That's how you would do it. And you would do it for marketing purposes. Another way of doing it now that, that covers a lot of different things, investing, marketing. It doesn't avoid legal liability as much as it does, it gives you privacy, okay? On the surface, because if, if you were involved in some kind of crime or something, it wouldn't matter, you know, what you're doing on the, on the front end because it could always be discovered what you're doing with the bank, right? But when you're marketing a, using a fictitious name, no one's ever gonna be able to track it back and see what the actual core company is called and who cares anyways. The other way is if I'm, let's say I want some privacy for myself personally. Let's say I want, um, I want a debit card. This is a simple version. I want a debit card with a fictitious name on it. Let's say I want to be known as, uh, I don't know, uh, John Smith, right? Whatever name. Well, I just open up a company or I already have a company 
I don't care what I have to call it. It doesn't matter. I have a bank account for it. Then I just go to the bank again and I ask, can I, how can I get the bank to recognize payments made to a fictitious name for this LLC, this current account holder? You already have the account opened. And now you could do it at the, at the time you open the account. Just depends on how you want to do it. I was just so, going to say, I didn't open yeah. an account yet. So that might be easier. So just ask them to say, just when you're, when you're opening the account, make sure that it's going to go through because sometimes they give you a hard time on the accounts and all that. But once you know you're going to get the account open, just say, oh, by the way, I might set up a fictitious name because I have a different marketing thing I want to try. And if, you don't have to explain yourself to the bank, but you just, you know, human beings, you, you just talk to people and they'll say, oh yeah, if you want a fictitious name on this account, we can do it right now for you. <laughs> or they might say, um, just have it documented, go register with the state. They, all, they also might say, the bank might tell you, publish the fictitious name in relation to the original company name in a local business journal. And they might say, do that three times. That is unusual. That's you're talking to somebody at the bank that's probably been there for a while. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, has more experience, but easily uh, you can do that um, through the secretary of state. So if I, now I have a, an LLC account with a debit card, but I can also get the debit card to issue the name, the individual name. So John Smith is not a human being's name. It's the name of a company, which is what the bank sees. But the rest of the world sees John Smith, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, I've done that with um, people that were in the middle of active levies. This is the best example. So the IRS is doing a, a levy on somebody. And this person, this one great example, this person, she's this woman who had a nice commission check from a real, being a real estate agent. Probably it was probably around $30,000. Well, she couldn't clear the funds because the IRS had levied everything and it was just sitting on all her accounts. And so as soon as she were to clear the funds and it's made out to her name, there's no way around having it paid out to a company. Okay. Most of the time, once the check's already issued, you're not going to be able to change it. And a lot of times no one's going to want to pay it to anyone other than yourself anyways, but you can work around that. So if she were to clear the funds or deposit them, they would have been gone and it wouldn't have solved her problem. So what we did is we set up a new LLC. She was a signer for it. Even though she's gone fire, she's got the IRS attacking her. Now in her case, we added her daughter um, to give Again, we use the changing the property rights to avoid liability. So she and her daughter were the signer and the owner. We just did it that way. There's versions of that. And then we got a DBA for the company. I don't even know what we called it, but we used her legal name that appeared on the check as the DBA. Now this takes time. It might take a week to do this, right? So once we did that, she was able to clear the funds at the same bank that the IRS was levying all her other accounts. So right next to all her accounts being levied, right next to the IRS, she's over there moving her money around, no problem. That would be another example of using a DBA. Okay. So could you use a DBA, let's just say you're, that LLC is holding um, multiple 1099s and maybe the name, you just want to use a, a DBA for a separate 1099. I guess sure. that would be for privacy. So that would be appropriate. That would be certainly a good use for it. And also organization. <laughs> so if I have different cash flows and also maybe different interests, maybe I have, maybe I'm managing cash flow where one cash flow is for a rental income that's mine. And then the other cash flow is for some other business thing where I have a partner, but we've agreed to use my, uh, my company to manage the cash flow. But certainly that would be great. I can use a DBA and the 1099 will be paid to the DBA. And, and that'll handle that. It'll separate it out because, because I've got two different interests here. I've got my own interest. Then I've got my interest with a partner. That'd be a great okay. example. Yeah. Okay. And what would be the process to change with the secretary of state? Would you just like add that to your same existing yeah. LLC that was registered? Or? Well, an easy, an easy way is to go log into the secretary of state and you mm -hmm. would register a fictitious name and in that process the state will ask you who who the owner is and you want it to be the company that you're working with it's like a new registration so a new registration of an llc it'll be no it'll be a new registration of a thing a thing you're registering with the secretary and but you're what you're going to do is make the llc that's already registered with that state the owner of this fictitious name and it'll ask you who the owner is don't make yourself the owner. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So 
my next question would be if you have assets that you've already purchased with your biological name, the one your social security number is registered to, could you find an existing LLC with, with that? And if not, how can you protect those assets? If that makes sense. You want to take something out of your name? Yeah. So, so let's just say, for example, I've already purchased crypto, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, I registered my name to that. Okay. okay. So how, like, can I, can I put that in my new LLC? Can I find my new LLC with, with that or, or, or no? How do yes, I, can. the answer okay. is yes. Okay. So, so just, I'm going to try to make this as easy as possible because sometimes you don't have to do anything. So if you, it depends on how you own and bought the coin. So if you bought crypto coins and you use a third party, like um, uh, Coinbase, mm -hmm. that's a third party. And for that, you, you want to not have it in your name. So let's say you did that in your name mm -hmm. and then that's no problem. Buying assets and not taxable. It doesn't matter if everybody sees it. But what you want to do is at the time you want to take profits, let's say you just keep it in Coinbase. You want to open up a new account at Coinbase uh, and use your LLC, use your pass through. And then once that's open up, now you have two accounts, you have a personal and a business at Coinbase, for example, or maybe it's a vault where you're holding gold, right? So then you open up a new account. That's how I like to do it that way. I just open a new account because that's cleaner. Um, and then I can literally move the property from my own title, my personal holdings to the company. I could just move it. And why can I do that? Because I retain beneficial interest. It's not a sale. It's no trick. I don't need a loan contract. I don't need to document it anyway. You just take it from here and put it over there. It's all perfect. Then you, you account for it however you want to. This is only if you're taking profits, because obviously it doesn't make any sense to transfer it to a new wallet if, you, if you've already purchased it or because it's only for you know, your eyes only. I wouldn't change it unless I had to. Uh, another reason why you might want to have, have to change it might, might be in that situation is because maybe you're getting sued. Maybe you're, there's some financial thing where you're personally liable for something and you don't want someone to reach into that asset. So then I would transfer it over. Um, the LLC allows you to change your property rights. Whereas if you just own the thing, you can't change your property rights. You can't even share them. And in the LLC, I can share my property rights and I can avoid liability for both people that share the rights or all three people. But personally, I can't do that. It used to be back in the 70s, you could just add your Uncle Bob to your bank account if you're getting sued and the creditor couldn't levy the money. But because of the way the banks operate now and software, the software dictates that even if your signature card says something else, the software ignores it. So we have to use an LLC and that allows us to change the property rights. So yeah, just move it over if it's a third party. The other way is, take it off a of Coinbase, right? To uh, put it into a ledger. Oh yeah, I never, I never yeah. keep my coins on exchange. Yeah. I'm just thinking like a purple, for your own personal wallet, it, it wouldn't matter really. It's not going to matter. As long as you keep it in, in your wallet, Yeah. Uh, no one can really, even Coinbase, the creator's not going to reach into Coinbase. Now in the future they might, but right mm -hmm. now no one's doing that. Unless you filed a bankruptcy, that's different. But yeah, that would be, just move it over. Okay. Thank you. And then I guess while um, while we're on this subject, and I'll save the, the loan process mm -hmm. for last. Okay. okay. Say you have a um, a scenario where you you have you are now renting um, a property that was your parents' home. Okay. Your parent is is on the deed, and so are you. So parent child on the deed. Um, parent is mentally incapacitated you are the POA for that parent and you want to protect that asset um, and you want to transfer deed uh, or transfer property rights to um, through a quick claim mm -hmm. deed when you're setting up an LLC to hold that quick claim deed does it have to be a multi-member LLC in this case, since the parent is also on the deed, A. B, I know Medicaid gets funny with this kind of stuff because she, mm -hmm. she is receiving um, mm -hmm. a community waiver in my home. Yes. Um, and 
three, if I would have to set it up to be a multi-member LLC, could I transfer funds from that LLC, if I can even do it, um, to, to an LLC that where I am the only one with rights, property Okay. Rights. Let's does, let's look at Does that make sense? I think so. I've, okay. I've heard this before. So th let's look at it in the perspective of you're qualifying for public benefits like Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So you you be very careful with that. So look at your application process and make sure that she, I'm not, I don't even, I'm not even looking at those right now. I'm just going to tell you that it's likely that the beneficial interests have to be have to remain the same yeah. at least in their eyes. So as far as the title goes if you have someone who, who's given you a power of attorney and you're the caretaker on the record, it looks like there's two owners on mm -hmm. the deed, like today, like from what you're describing, it looks like two owners. Now a court that may review it for some reason might say that there's only one owner because the other person's not competent, for example. But as far as the you know public record is concerned, you're fine with two. For, so what you're describing is what to keep your Medicaid Retaining beneficial interest would look like this. You would do a quick claim deed where the two current owners are now the two current members of the LLC. And you may have to explain that uh, to, the, to Medicaid if they, if they want to know, or you should probably just tell them or tell them ahead of time and make sure that they understand. And I can tell you right now, legally, that is the correct way to do it. It doesn't matter what they say. I, I hate to say that, but I mean, the truth is you might be dealing with people that don't understand at Medicaid. So it might yeah. take a little bit of time to deal with them, but the correct legal way is to retain the beneficial interest, even if you retitle it in the name of the LLC. Now dealing with one, one member who may not be competent, that would be very costly for someone to challenge. And you're in that situation you're describing probably would never happen. Medicaid is not going to do that. They're just going to accept it at face value. I know, because I once had an attorney tell me that I that I shouldn't do that, and you know, and now I'm you know I'm listening to your videos and and I'm just processing all this information, and I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why? why? It's a good it's a good question. So just I would say you can and be careful about retaining beneficial interest. That is the key thing that is so important. And just keep in mind, attorneys are good for um, I like them for research. I like them. I like them to go find stuff for me. I don't need their legal advice. A lot of times I just need a lot of, you know, some research or whatever, or I need access, or maybe I want attorney client privilege. So realize that an attorney is a lot of times without even realizing it, sometimes they, they just mean well, but they don't understand. A lot of times they're trained to create liability for people. So yeah, it's, it's and that like, makes sense. Yeah. yeah, that's what they do. I mean, that, they're a banking agent. They're an agent for the bank. So it's just like, you know, with fire, you know, you're not going to stick your hand in it, but you can use it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. with an attorney, attorney has certain things like I would use them to receive my mail. They're great for that because of privacy. And I, in fact, I use attorneys to, um, if someone needs to file tax returns, who's late for like several years, I'll, I'll have them go to an attorney and I'll do all the work, but I'll have them I'll have them pay the attorney and then have the attorney pay a, a CPA to do the returns and then I'll do the rest. And the reason why we do it that way is because when you pass the money that way and the attorney does all the work and through his office, the client gets attorney client privilege, right? So when we go to the IRS, That's awesome. after, yeah, when we get, he's going to get audited when you're late, right? For several yeah. years. Yeah. So when he, when he gets audited, I've, it's so fun to do this. The client just doesn't believe it. And when he, when he walks out, he goes in there for the audit and it's literally one minute and the audit's over. And the IRS agent says, oh, thank you for coming. We don't need to talk to you anymore. Because my client says, all you're going to get from me is what's on the four corners of the 1040. Everything else under attorney-client privilege. Oh, wow. That's a party killer. That just will kill the audit right there. The last person that did this, he was walking out to his car, calling me on the phone and laughing because he didn't believe it would, it would be that like that. And his wife was saying, don't do it, don't. And he's laughing. And I said, what are you laughing for? He goes, I, it's exactly what you said. <laughs> Oh my God, that's great. Yeah. Would you have so, to use like a, any particular attorney for that? No, they're all the same. They're a dime a dozen. I love saying that about attorneys. They're a dime a dozen. They got, we got too many attorneys. And, but the nice thing is bar membership gives you attorney client privilege. Uh, I hate to say bar membership, but bar membership is the thing part, part. I mean, we'd still have attorney client privilege either way, but you get an attorney who's a member of the bar and you're going to get attorney client privilege. We don't need them for tax advice or anything else in most cases. And a lot of times you can get documents that are necessary uh, on legal zoom. And uh, you know, sometimes you might need consultation along the way, but yeah, just realize who you're dealing with. 
attorneys are not about managing risk. What they're doing is creating risk or creating liability. They're not, in fact, they're the first risk I actually set up clients for. And this is what we're talking about, where I, where I started this video talking about changing property rights. I'll, my first concern is the client's risk of cost of litigation. That could be a lot of money. You could spend ten or hundred thousand dollars, and I, I've done it. I've, I, I know because I, I was stupid enough to um, not not do a contract with somebody one time, and they did something wrong, and it, um, I had to sue them, and uh, it didn't go. I, the lawsuit didn't need to go anywhere because it was just enough to sue them, and then we we got what we wanted. But it, literally, to just to do that, to not even get through discovery, that cost me a hundred thousand dollars, <gasps> and and my attorney, and it took me a year and a half. And it wasn't even, a, I mean, it didn't even go anywhere. And my, and my attorney, we, she was a really, you know, had a great sense of humor. And we were laughing about this. And I came in her office to give her the last check. And she goes, you know, you, you could have spent $500 with me and we could have avoided all this. And I said, I know, I know, you know, that's my tuition. So I'm not just saying this because I just made it up. I already spent the money. I already lost the money. So don't lose the money. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure I'll make some other mistake. And, <laughs> well, uh, try not to, but yeah, that's the idea. But don't get me started on attorneys. Ugh, they have. Oh place. yeah, they are so expensive too. Someone um, had a, someone told one of my clients that um, he needed forty five hundred dollars to prepare a quit claim deed in New York, and I said, "Now hold on, explain exactly what he's going to do for you." And she said, it, "It's a quit claim deed, which is one piece of paper. You know, you fill in the names." <laughs> I don't know what he needs $4,500 for. Maybe he needs a new car or something. I don't know. Maybe wow. he has gambling debts. Who knows? But yeah, you can say why. Now, since we're still on the subject of quick claim deeds, I once had an attorney told me that a general warranty date is better than a quick claim deed. Are you familiar with that? I am not. Yeah, I'd have to look at the statute, but there, each deed has its, has its place. And yes, the answer is yes. And if a local attorney tells you that, it's probably good information. I hate, I hate to say that, but sometimes, I mean, they, they tell you the right thing and it is the right thing, especially when it comes to real estate or yeah, real estate is specific to titles are specific to the local jurisdiction, but generally a quick claim deed will be sufficient. Warranty deeds in some cases might work. And I can't tell you the difference until I read the statute. Okay. And so if you came to me, like with that question, I would say, let me get back to you. And I would go pull the statute and I would read it. And I tell you exactly what was going on there. Uh, so it should what, be in yeah. the state statutes. It will be. All okay. um, all liens are statutory. So remember this phrase: all liens are statutory. Which we'll, we'll we'll be talking about this in a second here. But all liens are statutory. A quick claim deed is not so much a lien as it is color of title, but it is statutory, much like a lien. So it's so sensitive to the statute that you really need to understand the statute if an attorney says something like that. So if your attorney says that. Great, but be intelligent and go pull the statute. Don't just take his word for it. He's probably 100% correct, but go pull the statute and find out why. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. You were just a wealth of information. Um, so my last question would then be um, about taking loans from your you, I know you were talking in your one um, video, you get a windfall and uh -huh. instead of um, purchasing the liability, um, you, you can give yourself a loan uh, for that sure. specific process. Is there specific paperwork mm -hmm. that goes along with that? Like, especially with yeah. a mortgage um, yes. or a, a, a HELOC or like say I want to pay off right. my HELOC with my windfall, like, or, or whatnot, like okay. what would be the best way to do that? Okay. That, that opens up a can of worms. Okay. There's a couple of oh, things I'm going sorry. on there. Now that's good. This is great. This is great. That's why I want to do this a recording. All right. So, so the loan itself. So just, just avoid structuring a loan. Y'all know that loans are not taxable. So don't try to use that as this cure all for any type of tax that you might think you might be encountering. I would just caution you that way first. So what that means is, here's an example. Can I just take a loan out to pay my living expenses? The answer is yes. Yes, you can document it. And if the IRS audits you for some random reason and not because of that, and they look at it and they might go, this smells funny. <laughs> I don't want to be that person. 
I wouldn't want you to be that person. So the loan should be real. It should be for some purpose. You're on the hook for your living expenses. Don't try and escape those. So if I'm going to do a loan, it's if I'm going to document a loan, it's because it's a documentable loan. It's not that it's an unsecured loan from my LLC. Don't do that because you're going to create problems for yourself. You're going to have to try to justify all of it. The best way to do a loan for an LLC when you have a nice windfall and the LLC has the money and you want to take a chunk of it and use it for something, do that. Move the money around. It doesn't have to come to, you, to yourself directly. So what, the way you do it is when you buy real estate and you transfer the, for, so your LLC has this windfall and you're going to use a new LLC to hold the title to the real estate. Just for example, mm -hmm. I can take cash from my first LLC and I can simply spend it to the other LLC. In the real estate example, I can simply spend it to the seller and have the title held in the name of the LLC. I just did this recently for some land. I just told the agent, hey, um, I'll get back with you on how I want to title it, but I'm sending the money. And then he's like, oh, okay, well, then who's going to be the buyer? <laughs> and I said, I'll, I'll email you later. So I made up the company name and we sent the money over there. Now, if I want to make it show it as a loan, I don't need to have that conversation with the seller. I can close and let's say it's clear title. And then I can go and get a mortgage and support it with a note. Now here's, here's how we do this. We go to Sally May's website. I think it's like sallymay.gov or something like that. You can Google this. It's um, Sally May mortgage security forms, something like that securities. And um, I don't keep this bookmarked and I don't keep it at the ready because I always want to share it with people. And I want to describe how I find it every time. And every time I need, like, if you come to me and you need a, a lien document, I will go there. And so I, I go and find my mortgage or trustee document that you would use. It's a government standard mortgage or trustee contract. And that is by state. And you can download it and edit it. You can download it in Microsoft Word or ODT, LibreOffice, PDF, all these things. And so you would edit that document. So, so on a loan, see, you notice I took the cash from one LLC and I put it into another purchase and I'm holding the title. Now I just funded, I took cash from one LLC and I funded another LLC. That's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then I document a loan. So the way I document the loan is I literally write up the loan on the mortgage contract. I go and put the terms. So there's a little bit to it. I have a video on how to do this, but basically I'm going to, I'm usually going to make, I'm, I'm going to amortize my loan for if it's real estate or a place to live or a house, I'm going to amortize it for 30 years. Why? Because everybody else does that. If I do it for five years, that looks kind of funny. No problem, but I want it to look like everybody else. So I do a 30 year amortized loan, but let's say I don't want to have a 30 year mortgage. Nothing says I can't pay it off early, right? I can also have a balloon payment in five years. So there's all kinds of ways I can structure the payment but I do whatever I want. I put the mortgage together. I put all the numbers. I go to, um, I search on the internet for amortization calculator and I type in my principal amount and my interest rate. Give yourself a decent interest rate. It shouldn't be zero. It should be something that's real based on what you think your credit is. And it could be close. It doesn't have to be accurate. It could be realistic. Like what's the, what's the decent, like if, if a good rate right now is 4%, for me, I'd probably give myself a six and a half percent rate. It doesn't really matter anyways because you're managing all the money. So you give yourself a real rate. So you got your mortgage contract all, all done. Then you go to, you pull down the note from the same place, Sally Mays. You pull down a promissory note for your state. <coughs> so, excuse me. And then you, you put the numbers in the missing fields that match the mortgage or the trust deed. The, the note itself should be dated. You can notarize it, it's not necessary. Um, most cases I don't do that. I just have it ready. I deliver it to the client and I say to the client, put this note in a safe place, maybe make a backup copy somewhere because no one's ever going to see it. And I'll tell you why we do it this way. Then we go and record the mortgage. And this is the key thing. So you're documenting a loan, whether or not the money changed hands or the moving cash from one LLC to another, that's all it was. But when I record a mortgage, now it's a loan because I've documented the nature of the transaction. And I wanna do it that way because it's public record and it's secured. I don't care about giving myself an unsecured loan for groceries, but I wanna do this for secured collateral, collateralized property of record so everybody can see. And the reason why we put the note in there and, and no one's ever challenged that I know of. I mean, I've never seen cases like this. I mean, someone could do it, but if anyone wants to challenge the legitimacy, legitimacy of the mortgage, 
um, you would have a note to show them if you had to. And it's very unlikely that would ever happen. But just, just I, I say, if I do that for a client, you know, he may just forget about everything. It's all done. And five years later, eight, 10 years later, he's still got the mortgage. It's all working great. And then someone wants to challenge it and he doesn't know what to do. But if I give him the note now and he never gets to use it, great. If he has to use it, he, he already knows where to go to get it. <clears throat> so that would be that, that reason. That's how you document real estate. And you probably want to. It's another way to strip equity, right? Once you have clear title, one way to protect the equity is to just strip it with a mortgage. So what you're doing is, so let's say you move the cash from your first LLC to your second. The second LLC is the, the title holder. You still need that lender. The lender could be that first LLC, the note lender. The borrower can be the other LLC. You can also make yourself the borrower. That's a normal transaction, but there's nothing wrong with making the other LLC a borrower. Okay, you can go either way and you can title the property still in the LLC, but you're the borrower. Just keep in mind that if you paid off quickly, which I don't recommend, we can talk about that too, um, you, you may create a tax liability for yourself. So anytime you have a large loan in your name, just realize the better way to handle the debt is to not pay it off, but to offset it with another cash flow. So there's, an, there's two reasons. One is I'm not going to create a tax liability by paying it off early. I'm not going to create a lump sum payment and put, push myself into a new tax bracket. And I, I'm not going to have um, a bad use of capital. So I always look at terms of, I always look at money like this. Like if I have $100,000 on my desk, I'm, I'm asking myself, what's this costing me to be staring at it right now? It's costing me money because it's not out doing something for me. And it does, it costs me, it's, I'm losing money. Like tomorrow it'll be worth, you know, $3 less. I don't know, $15 less. So I look at money like that. So if I take cash and I put it into, let's say it's, um, let's say I put cash into an asset. Maybe I, I put cash into this and the second LLC is, is owning an apartment complex, a, a two unit rental, right? And I'm getting positive cash flow out of it. Well, I've got all my cash in this. Yeah, it's making me money, but my cash could be out doing something else too. I need to go get some loan money and finance myself out of it. If, I, if it's my own loan, if I'm structuring it, so my interest in the property is always the same and I'm just structuring a, a, as a loan, my money is still tied up in this transaction. So I still need to do something with that cash. So just keep that in mind. That is another type of risk that a lot of people don't want to talk about or don't know that that's a risk. So paying off a debt early is not a good idea. I guess it's to summarize it. But that's how you structure a mortgage. Um, can, can I mention car unless you have some questions? Yeah, no, I was just yeah. going to ask. So, so obviously this is assets, asset yeah. to asset from one LLC to another. What if you are personally living in the home? Can you do that or no? You can. I mean, it looks funny. Uh, that's yeah. why you want to keep the title out of your name. But then again, I mean, even if you have a, a PMA or some another name in there, you still have the beneficial interest. So here's what it looks like. A thing in which you have the beneficial interest lent money to a thing in which you have the beneficial interest and you still retain the beneficial interest. You're living there, you're, you got that benefit and you had the benefit in the money and you, are, you have both companies. So if the IRS were to see that, they could disregard all that whatever, who owns what, where, and they could just look at beneficial interest and they could make a determination and say, well, all you did was take money from over here and you bought yourself a house. They could do that and they probably should do that. So just keep that in mind. So then that would be a taxable okay. event. Or they could, they could um, say, they could um, say that you had, yeah, they could say that it's a taxable and it was under reporting and all they would do is send you a bill. I mean, maybe. And um, I don't know that I can recall seeing that too much. I mean, it's, it's too convoluted. <clears throat> Even though you shouldn't do things like that, it's too convoluted. Here's where your big risk is. I mean, if you're going to get sued by somebody, a judge would look at that and make the same conclusion. And you have a bigger liability there because when it comes to courts, they're courts give judgments to creditors that are unfriendly. They're less friendly than the IRS. Um, and you have rules of discovery. And those, those, um, those civil proceedings can allow a creditor to investigate all kinds of things where the IRS doesn't care, even though the IRS could do things like that, the IRS just wants to take stuff it can find. So you're better off with the IRS situation. So 
<clears throat> trying to think. Yeah, just, just realize that that's what it looks like. And so I'm going to give you a phrase to think about. So the IRS would call this self-dealing. Lending to yourself. So you could have a company, your company, lend money to another company. Yeah, you retain beneficial interest. You can make your ownership of each company on the public records different. This is done all the time. And on the surface, it's going to be fine. If someone were to investigate it, they would ultimately determine that the beneficial interests were the same or at least questionable. And this is not a problem. I mean, people do it all the time and it's still a legitimate transaction. Just know that someone could probably pierce that. Something to keep in mind. I've never had that problem. I, I've, I've even done that during, um, during a lawsuit. Um, basically taking property away from a creditor <laughs> and they didn't want to spend the money to go after it. So it's expensive. And I kind of know that it's kind of a game, even though they can call then call the fraudulent conveyance. Um, but they're not going to do anything about it because it's too expensive and they're not going to advise their clients to do anything in most cases. I don't think I've even ever had that. I've ever even seen that. In many of the cases I've taken over the years, the plaintiff was entitled to do that and, and they never did. Interesting. So, so the worst yeah. that could happen could be that that the IRS used this as underreporting and sure. then they'll send you a bill. Sure. And it's, and it's unlikely that that would happen, but just keep that in mind. It just looks like self-dealing. And it's so all the effort you put into making a loan and all that, the IRS have just ignored that, um, but still do it and still act that way. I mean, when I, when I take money out of a company and I buy a car, I'm going to make payments on the car and I'm going to document those. In fact, I may, I may deposit the money in the bank account for the LLC. Just make sure you have a different cash flow source. <laughs> you don't want to take money out of the LLC and put it back in. That, that's kind of silly. You know, you'll, you'll be laughed at. So, so don't do stuff like that. Uh, the other thing is you can, like we're talking about, you can take money from the company, fund another company. You can document it in any way you want. Uh, so it looks normal. Uh, another thing to do is if you're buying a vehicle, you can use cash from the first LLC, buy the vehicle. You can put the vehicle in your name. And so what you would do is when the money gets wired or you hand the certified check to the dealer, you just tell the dealer that the money is loan money from the lender and the lender needs the lien documentation. And then the dealer will take care of that. No questions asked. They don't care. And so what will happen is the dealer will create the lien documents on the title and send the title or certificate of title to the lender, okay, which is your LLC. And it could, your LLC could have your home address and the dealer doesn't care. They're just going to do what you ask, right? Okay. So they'll, yeah, they'll document the loan, however you tell them. So let them do all that work. You don't even have to go find a mortgage document, all that. The dealer will handle all that for you. Very oh simple. Yeah. So that's one way to do it. Buy it in your name, put the lien on there. The other way to do it is buy in the name of the company. So, or a trust. Like on your way to go to the, uh, the, the dealer to buy your car, you think of a name of a trust. You might, let's say you're buying a BMW. So maybe the name of the trust is going to be the BMW 100 trust. Because the last one was the BMW 99 trust, you know, <laughs> or the next one's the 200 trust, whatever. <clears throat> you know, it could be something simple like that. So the title holder of the vehicle can be a trust. You can say it's a trust. Um, if someone asks you for the trust documents, you're not going to, the car dealer is not going to care. <clears throat> the bank will but not the car dealer. I like to use LLCs. They're more versatile. Um, I could also take an LLC and put a lien on the vehicle and then use the LLC for other purposes because the lien doesn't transfer liability like ownership does. So there's another use there. <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, if I have an LLC and I want to own two different unlike risks, a vehicle and a house, for example, that's not a good combination because a vehicle is a very large risk and a, a, a home that you live in is not and so if my LLC owns both, and it's likely, let's say this car is in a wreck, it, the driver can be sued. And if the driver owns the house or has an interest in the house, or the mm. owner is the same, right? So now I've just connected this liability, which is crazy, to a house which never had that yeah. liability. Yeah. So the way you separate that out is you have the house owned by the LLC and take the same LLC, but have a lien on the vehicle with it, not title. So lien and title are two different things and you can use the same owner, the same party for one lien and one title, or I can, you know, any combination of that. <clears throat> I 
my gosh, this really is just a new way of thinking. Yeah, just changing property rights and, yeah. and, and making it legitimate. We're not trying to, you know, I mean, actually, we're not even hiding anything. We want people to see, we want the IRS to see if they want to question because hopefully we did everything right. I mean, I've never, never had a client so far where the IRS said, hey, you, uh, you know, you did this thing and now you owe us this money. I've never had a problem. Usually it's, they already had that problem, right? So I get them out of it and we do these things. So, yeah. So how, how would you treat taking money from an LLC to use for, um, like you were saying, for expenses? That's just a taxable event. Is, sure. there any, is there any way to do that the best way possible or does it not matter? It doesn't matter, but I could tell you this. Okay, so living expenses, let's say it costs you where you live and your demographic, it costs you 80,000 a year, 60,000 a year to live comfortably where, you know, your lifestyle. Let's say your annual living expenses are $60,000. Well, you're not going to be able to tell the IRS that you only made $40,000. So just keep that in mind. But just because your living expenses are $60,000 and you're kind of going to have to report $62,000 a year uh, legitimately, it doesn't mean that if you become a millionaire that you need to report $5 million a year. Just because you're a millionaire doesn't mean your $62,000 needs to become $1.2 million. Because so, the rest of it stays in the, yeah, exactly. in the asset and you just take out what you need. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. if I want to buy a yacht, well, it's not me. It's that company over there that bought the yacht and I'm not going to be the owner, but I get to go there on the weekends, you know? So the money gets moved around the things that, you know, so that you don't take the property and the liability with it. Okay. <clears throat> yep. And, and would you have to transfer that in any particular way like would you transfer from an llc to a personal bank account or um does it not matter whatever is easier for you do you like okay. ach do you like paypal a check <laughs> okay, okay. You know, however if you want to take the cash or i would just recommend i mean you can spend money from your llc to pay your light bill i just don't recommend that as a regular practice i do that because of the way i'm set up because I have a company that only does that. If I have another venture going on or a partner or something, I'm always going to set up another company. But I have a company that's really old and it's expired and I just use it for all my personal things. No one ever, it, it doesn't, it's just for privacy. Um, but the better way to do it is if you want to take money out of an LLC for personal use, just go ahead and do that. Just put it in your personal account and then spend it. The only exception to that is if your personal account is under levy, you know, if you have some weird thing going on, then of course you want to go around that. I'll give you an example. Um, if I, if I rescue a, a small business, like this is an office, like say a dentist office and they're, they're having, usually the IRS is the, the, the case. So the IRS is levying till take on all the receivables, a merchant account, all the receivables. So it's just starved them out. They're, the IRS is so stupid sometimes. They just they just take all the money and they kill the business. And I think maybe that's their purpose is to kill the business where they could just they could just take a little bit, but they want to kill everything. So what I'll do is I'll set up a pass through an LLC and I'll I'll change the merchant processing, the check processing, insurance payouts. All that gets routed back to the LLC. So now the S corp that was being levied by the IRS can't be levied anymore. Even though the levies are still valid, there's no more money to levy. And and so the dentist is able to pay his workers, pay the light bill and, and still pay himself and get a reprieve and just sit back with the IRS. And then the, the IRS comes to the table and they're so polite and they want to make a deal and because they can't get anything until they ask permission because we just took the money away and they can see what we did. It's not like it's a secret. They can see all those receivables they were getting. They're now going over there, but they can't touch it because it's not, it's an innocent party. And, and it's, it, it's not owed to the S Corp yet, yet. So it's not a receivable of the S Corp and they can't make that company pay the IRS first. It's that simple because all we did is what? We changed the property rights right in front of them. Okay. All right. Well, this is certainly um, a lot to, um, lot to think about and um, determine how I want to structure and move forward. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, oh, good. Um, I'll uh, I'll save the recording for you, and then um, I'll make it available. Do you mind if I uh, publish it? No. Okay, because I think it'll help a lot of people. Oh, that's good. All right. Um. So so you made the one LLC for me, so I'm gonna work.